you know, I can introduce you if you'd like. Okay, talk. cool. So I just want to welcome everyone to the, the Central Pine Barrens Commission's Protected Lands Council hosting of uh, Ticks in Paradise by, uh, <laughs> on parade, not in paradise. We are in paradise. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Ticks on, par uh, God, on parade. Um, I'm Polly Wiegand. I am the Science and Stewardship Program Manager for the Central Pine Barrens Commission. And we're happy to have Tamsin give this presentation, especially as we start with our field season um, on how to protect ourselves from tick-borne diseases. It seems like each year there's a new disease or a new insect that, that threatens our health. And so, you know, we host this presentation every year um, to help inform and update ourselves and ensure that we're prepared for the field season. So uh, Tamsin Ye is the pest um, an IPM uh, specialist for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County, who I've had the pleasure of working with for over the last 20 years in my stead here. And, um, you know, Tamsin is going to give you an excellent introduction, um, not only to the ticks, but the diseases that you can get and how to protect yourself um, thereafter. So without ado, Tamsin, I've, I'm recording this. Uh, okay, you got your pause button off. Get rid of my note. We're good, and uh, okay. I'll let you uh, move to it. I, just a couple of things. If you could keep your videos off um, and your microphones off, and then at the end, um, you can unmute yourselves and ask questions. I don't have the chat feature enabled here. Um, so if you can just ask is the questions of Tamsin. Mm -hmm. Or is it unmuted? Uh, I'm screaming at you. Yeah, you're... Um, and just keep everything muted until the end, and then we can uh, ask Tamsin questions. Um, I think that'll be the easiest. So, all right, go Sorry. for it, Tamsin. Cool. All right. So right there, we have Long Island's number one tick, which is the Lone Star tick. And we'll be doing a lot of talking about the Lone Star tick and all of the brethren thereof. And you know, sometimes you feel like you are simply the great big meal for all of these vector vectors and their vector-borne diseases. Nom, 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 nom. So the first thing we want to start out with is the generalized tick life cycle. Here we have the generalized life cycle of the Lone Star tick, but most ticks, all ticks, are going to have this life cycle. So we got the adult female, and she's mated, and she really wants to lay her eggs. So she takes a blood meal, and the blood is necessary for her to mature her eggs properly, just like a mosquito. So she lays her eggs in the leaf litter several thousand at a time. Then she really wants a big bar of chocolate and then she dies. So these eggs hang out in the leaf litter over the winter. And then the following year, all of the little larvae hatch out. And what those larvae do after they've hatched out kind of depends on the tick. But the larvae are the first stage, and they aren't going to give you anything if larvae bite you because the first thing they're feeding on is, is you then they decide they're gonna take a blood meal. They will molt again to form the nymph, which is what you see all the way over on the left side. The nymph will feed on things and that's when they start to acquire diseases. They take a blood meal and then they become an adult. So the blood meals that really provide the disease exposure are gonna be for the nymphs and for the adults, for the most part, as far as we know. Of course, things could change, but that's what we know so far. So a female lone star tick can lay over 8,000 eggs before she dies. Ugh. A female black-legged tick lays about 3,000 eggs before she dies. Anybody want to do the math? That's one tick. Even I can do that math, and I don't do math well. Oh, God, she needs chocolate. And you would not see these <coughs> in nests or what have you, like they say, <coughs> excuse me, on the internet. They're down in the leaf litter. I've only seen um, a group of tick eggs once, and it was just a fluke that I happened to pick it up when I was looking through leaf litter. Okay, so what are the big three that we have to deal with on Long Island? Hands down, <clears throat> the most common tick on Long Island is the Lone Star tick. And the stages that want to feed on us are the adults, the nymphs, and the larvae. All of them happily bite humans and enjoy sucking our blood. The second tick that I have pictured here is the black-legged or deer tick. Same thing, just two different names. And these are the ones that we are uh, familiar with because they're the only ones that carry Lyme disease. Fortunately, only the adults and the nymphs are likely to bite humans. The larvae feed on rodents, but unfortunately, 
the nymph of the black-legged or deer tick is the one that's likely to transmit Lyme disease to us. And then there are the American dog ticks. And these are the largest of the three main ticks that we have in Long Island. And we tend to blow them off, but they carry Rocky Mountain spotted fever, which can make you extremely sick or easily kill you. Only the adult is gonna feed on us. The larvae and the nymphs really prefer a meal of rodents. And this is the fourth tick. And if you guys see this when you're out scouting, please report it to us because we're trying to keep an eye on this. And this, of course, is the Asian longhorned tick. If you see a tick with a flip hairdo, and we're gonna talk an awful lot about the mouth parts up there, see those little points sticking out. Um, that is the new one. They like uh, sunny and wet areas and they really love to feed on livestock. But we are trying to keep an eye on this one because it will feed on us too. Um, but we're trying to see, they have them upstate, but we want to see if they're really prevalent down here or not. Okay, so back to the three main ticks. So Lone Star ticks are the biggest relationship in the uh, life of the deer. The deer really move them around. If you have a lot of deer, especially if the deer are trafficking back and forth in your yard, they are the ones that are really dropping Lone Star ticks all over the place. Interestingly enough, the black-legged or deer tick doesn't move very far from where it hatches out. It will have maybe a six foot radius or eight feet at the most, and it doesn't go very far. It is a stay at home tick. Unfortunately, so are the rodents it's associated with, like the white footed mouse and the chipmunk. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, as I said, lone star ticks move around, black legged ticks do not. So you have to think of that both in terms of the animal that they're associated with and how you are treating for them. You want to keep your treatment radius small for the deer tick and larger for the Lone Star tick. And we know that both rodents and deer really dig bird seed, but we also know that birds are messy. They only wanna pick through and eat what they wanna eat and the rest of it, they're chucking out of the feeder and it tends to accumulate below the feeder. And that's a great spot for rodents and deer to congregate. And of course, the ticks they're associated with, especially if you've got a little rock wall feature or a snag or a log that's laid down. Rodents love that to hide in. So that's a perfect storm right there for contact. So clean up under your bird feeders if you can. So where do we begin? Look down, look down, they're on your ankles now. Um, ticks tend to, well, they all do, they walk upwards, which is called positive geotropism. So we feel like they've dropped into our hair, but actually what they've done is they boogied like crazy upwards. And they've got these little hooks on the ends of their legs that allow them to hang onto skin and onto hair. We see right here lone star ticks, and they're odd in that they will attack on moss. Uh, they will get on you in a lot of the whole egg clutch when it hatches out, they will actually get on you and start climbing up. Other ticks are more solitary when they go after you. We're going to begin with proper identification. It's real easy to see, did I just do what I think I did? Okay, we're going to have a pop quiz. Here we go. I always do this. Okay, the first thing we want to do is we want to figure out if it's really a tick. And there's a lot of tiny little things that are tick wannabes, little beetles, little spiders, etc. So we have to figure that out. So we start out with our magnifying glass, which we can, if you're cheap, cheap, cheap like me, get at the dollar store. So we want to see if it has antenna. If it has antenna, nope, not a tick. Does it have wings? Nope, not a tick. Does it only have six legs? Not a tick. Three body parts, not two. It has three body parts, not a tick. So this one's clearly not a tick. It's a beetle. And you can see the antenna, you see the six legs, and you see the three body parts. And if you're not sure, then get something to magnify it and check it out. Now this one, obviously, is a tick. It's got two body parts, it's got eight legs, doesn't have any antenna, doesn't have any wings, looks more like a spider because ticks, in fact, are related to spiders. And you pass the tick test. Hey, you got a tick. Now you got to decide what kind of tick you have. So the first step is to separate deer or black-legged ticks from the other kinds because we're most concerned with uh, the carriage of Lyme disease and only the deer tick can do that. And it's actually relatively easy to sort the deer tick out from the other ticks. So you wanna look at the pie crust of the tick. What in the world am I going on about? Ticks have this little rim that runs around. And if you've got a deer or black legged tick, the rim that runs around the tick is smooth. There aren't any little septations in it like you see on the tick on the right, you'll see the little breaks 
in that pie crust. It looks like a fluted pie crust. And so that can give you a little bit of ease of mind, even though all the other ticks also carry diseases, but they cannot carry Lyme disease. So there's a fluted pie crust just to give you the idea. So now we have a pop quiz. Which rim is which? If we look at the rim on the left, we can clearly see that there are segments in it. So it's not a deer tick, but the one on the right has a smooth rim, plus it has the mahogany coloration of the belly, which is very characteristic, and it has darker legs. But I don't like to use leg color to identify because when ticks first molt, they hatch out, their legs will be light color. It takes them a while to darken as they um, harden off. So that's why I don't like that. Now, why in the world do I have two sets of pliers and an old fashioned candle mold up here? Am I insane? Yes, I am. But in this case, there is a method to my madness. If we look all the way over to the left, we see a pair of blunt nose pliers. That looks like the mouth parts of the dog tick, because the dog tick has mouth parts that look like those pliers. The one in the center where you've got points that come together are needle nose pliers. Those look like the mouth parts of the deer or black legged tick. And then finally, the old fashioned candle mold looks like the mouth parts of the Lone Star Tick. Lone Star Ticks have really long mouth parts and it's really easy to see them even with the naked eye. You don't always need that magnifying glass. So suppose you did have a deer tick, gasp. Well, what can we expect? There's the male, he's all dark. We can see that his little mouth parts push together in a point. There's the female, she really has the needle nose pliers. She's got a mahogany abdomen, she's got that black shield and she has dark legs. And then we have the whole darn family who got together. They're not social distancing there, obviously. They got together for a barbecue. We got Papa Tick all the way over the left. We got Mama Tick. And then we have next to Mama Tick, the one that is hands down most likely to make you sick. That is the nymphal deer tick. They're about half the size of a sesame seed. They are almost triangular when you look at them and they are really tiny. And the other weird thing about the deer tick is that their saliva is not horribly itchy like the Lone Star tick is. So you're not likely to notice this little nymph here until after they have fed on you for 24 hours or more. And that is the critical amount of time that you need in order to transmit tick-borne diseases. There are a couple that can transmit before that time. Some of them need a little longer, but that 24-hour mark is really important. So it's very important to get the ticks off of you before they've had a chance to feed for more than 24 hours. And again, if you look at the nymphal mouth parts there, you can see how close together they are and how they look like the needle nose pliers. Larvae, we don't worry about because of course they're feeding on rodents. So how likely is it that you'll encounter a male deer tick? I usually see them in the winter. They're out there, you know, they're looking for a lady friend when nothing much is doing. The likelihood of encountering them at any point during the year is only moderate. The time of year of encounter is February to June. And I want to mention that deer ticks or black-legged ticks really like that um, interface between out in the open and the woods because they have such a serious requirement for moisture that they really cannot go out into the lawn very much. They hate hot, dry conditions, unlike the Lone Star ticks. So you're always gonna find them in a moisture area, right in a little bit of the shade line or in the woods themselves, or they really love to hang out around, along logs because that's where the little rodents run. So you'll see them there. Adult female, same thing. The likelihood of encountering her is only moderate from February to June. And then here's the nymph tick. This is the one hands down that's most likely to make you sick, but you only have a low to moderate chance of encountering nymphal ticks. Usually it's from April to July, right when you put on your short shorts when you're out there doing yard work. However, they are around the rest of the year. <clears throat> we were doing some tick work in October, they were there and on a warm day, they were plentiful. So these are the ones that are most likely to give you disease because we don't see them until after they've fed for more than 24 hours. Okay, so what if it wasn't a deer tick? What do you have to choose from? So back to your little magnifying glass. The first thing you wanna do, if you can, is to look at the mouth parts. We see on the left that we have a dog tick. See those blunt mouth parts that look like the blunt needle nose pliers. This also looks like the crazy emperor from a video game. You can see the hat, you can see the, the mouth, you can see the eyes, and he's doing the macro, she's doing the macarena. 
Now I'm just joking about that, but you can definitely see there's a difference in the mouth parts between the dog tick that is on the left and the lone star tick. See how that's a long candle mold mouth part? So that can help you to quickly tell the difference between the two, and there it is again. Okay, so here's what you have to choose from if you don't have a deer tick. If you have a dog tick, you only have to worry about the adults. There's mama all the way over to the left. She is um, brown and she has a beautiful white shield. Papa, he's got some of that um, Art Deco thing going on. He's got a neat pattern on him. And again, those blunt mouth parts. Then if we don't have the dog tick, we have all the life stages to choose from with the Lone Star tick, which is the most common one on Long Island. The first one in the Hollywood squares there is Mama. She's got that white dot in the center, which the Lone Star takes its name from. Papa's got some bling right along the edge of his pie crust. You can see it there. And then there's the nymph um, below Mama Tick. That shows that being a little bit elongated, but actually they're the size and the shape of the head of a pin. They're very, very round, very easy to recognize. And then finally, we have the little tiny larval Lone Star Ticks. And that's what everybody thinks is or are chiggers. And even medical professionals will say these are chiggers because that's what people always call them. But we don't really have chiggers on Long Island. And the reason I'm showing this unable to see thing is that there are little dots all over here. Each of those little dots represents a larval Lone Star tick. They look like moving dust. And so Samson, can you put that a little closer to the camera? I can try it. How's that? Better? Yeah, there we go. Good, Holly. Thank you. See the little dots? Those are all ticks. And so when you walk through the grass, you may end up with 5,000 or more new little friends. And the reason that they stop on your feet and your ankles is they're toddlers. They get tired. So they sort of dig in any place that they can find a meal. And we'll talk more about them in a minute. Let's talk about the dog ticks first, because those are always cool. There's and there is Papa Dog Tick, and we don't have to worry about the others because they don't feed on us, and you can really see the segmentation on the rim. Like I said, we tend to blow these off because we've always had these on Long Island. Lone Star Ticks, not so much. They sort of blew in, perhaps on a storm in the 80s, but the dog ticks have always been here. However, they can give you Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, which we will talk about a little bit later. Okay, life stages, there's the male, nice up and close and personal, there's the female, and what can you expect? Very high, like, high likelihood of encountering them from February to September for both of them. Um, and now we'll move on to the Lone Star Tick, which is the star of our show. Okay, so here's a family reunion. There's Mama, you can see the segments on her rim, you can see her white dot. Papa with his glitter um, on the rim of him, and he's a little bit Got that that rim's a little flattened on him and then there you can see the nymph that really does look very round and that's what you'll see size and shape of the head of a pin and then down at the bottom there next to a penny we've got these little tiny dusty um larval lone star ticks and boy do they itch when they get you okay so what can you expect well adult male lone star very high likelihood of encountering them um, March to September. They tolerate our hot, dry summers better um, than a lot of other ticks. Even they, if we have a drought, tend to go dormant. Um, at certain times of the year, depending on the weather conditions, we can't count on that. We can't count on any weather conditions um, affecting them in a regular way. Adult female Lone Star, likelihood of encountering very high. March to September usually. There's the nymph. Now the likelihood of encountering them is extremely high or very high. March to November. These guys will congregate wherever rodents are congregating and that means ground cover. So if you've got pleuriope or um, you have pachysandra or you have vinca or anything like that, rodents love to run into there because it's a great uh, cover for them and that's where these hang out. So the way you can disperse nymphal ticks immediately is you give your ground cover a haircut. It's going to look awful. Just mow right over it. But that disperses the ticks. The rodents no longer have any place to hide. So they're not going to, ticks aren't going to hang around because there's nothing to eat. The rodents are, have gone away. And your ground cover will grow back. And we actually proved this um, out at Suffolk County Community College. We told them to whack everything down. And the next day, nothing. You could not scare up a nymph to, to save yourself. Okay, now larvae. And we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the larvae. The likelihood of encountering them is very high, and the time of year to encounter is late May to October. And, and when we first started turning them up in late May, everybody was like, nah, 
And then we show them a piece of tape, they're like, ooh, because they are there. So you have to start being careful in about a week. Memorial Day, they may be out and about looking for you to snack on. The disease present potential for larvae is zip because you're the first thing that they have fed on. However, if you're attacked in mass by these a couple of times, you do have potential to develop an allergy called alpha-gal. And that means that you'll have an allergy to red meat. And this is what people think are chiggers. Okay, now if you watch Family Guy, you are familiar with the concept of the cankle. That is my very own cankle there with the little red arrows on it. And those little dots under the red arrows are larval lone star ticks. We went out to Montauk to do some work on carpenter bees and I almost came home with 10,000 new friends. Fortunately, I saw my socks before I got in the car. My socks stay in Montauk. They're having a great time. They send me a postcard every single year. But this was just simply from brushing up against some grass. Now, here's the reason that people think that chiggers and lone star larvae are interchangeable. Because externally, the gross anatomy of what happens looks very similar. You get these little blisters. But actually, the feeding strategies of the larval lone star ticks and chiggers are very, very different. Larval lone star ticks take a blood meal. They need to do that in order to molt. Whereas chiggers don't feed on blood at all. What they do is they spit out a little thing of enzymes. The enzymes digest a little hole into your skin and the enzymatic activity actually <clears throat> breaks down proteins. So the proteins will kind of harden into a cement creating a feeding tube. So that chigger has access to the juice in your cell. So it's sucking it up, having a great time, whereas ticks take a blood meal. Now, one of the big problems about telling the difference between chiggers and larval lone star ticks is that they are mislabeled on the internet. So here on the left, you see a true chigger, and it's a mite. You can tell that it is a stage of a mite, but on the right, there's larval lone star ticks. And now you can clearly tell that they are. You can see the little segments uh, in their pie crust. You can see the mouth parts. And you're like, wait a minute, I only see six legs. Yeah, larval ticks do only have six legs. They get their last pair of legs when they molt into nymphs. But everything else, you can obviously see that. Yet, how is that labeled on the internet? As a chigger. So you have to be really careful. And there is another up close and personal of said chigger. And this is what the chigger looks like when it is fully fed and before it is fully fed. So you can see they blow up like me when I go to the all you can eat buffet. All right, and there we go. There's a chigger feeding and there is a tick feeding into the bloodstream. So that's the difference there. And ever wonder why you can't pull a tick out easily? If you pry apart the mouth parts of the tick, you'll see right in the center, they have this feeding structure that has backwards facing barbs like a fish hook. So those attach to your skin and it's really hard to pull them out. Plus they, pro they produce a cementing agent which allows them to stay stuck. So, so far, we haven't found chiggers on Long Island. We have looked for them. There's a special thing called a chigger board, et cetera. Never say never though. I just have not seen them, but we do see larval lone star ticks and because they attack en masse, you'll wake up at three o'clock in the morning with all these little red bumps all over you if you're not paying attention. And larval lone star ticks look like moving dust. The other bad thing is, and I should have had a sock here to show you, I'm cheap. I buy my socks at the dollar store. And if you stretch them, hold them up to the light, you can see light right through those and through, through the weave. And of course, the little tiny ticks will dart right in there and have a good time. So there we go. What's the little chick say? Cheep, 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 cheep. There are my cheap socks and you can see the holes. That the ticks can go right through. These are clover mites. You know, you ever sit down on a bench in June and you're, you're happy, you're having a good time and suddenly you look down and it's like, oh, and there are all these little red things. They want to be bad, but they're harmless. Just squish them. But don't wear your white satin shirt when you do that because otherwise you'll end up with little red stains all over the place. Okay. So Lone Star larvae, and you can see how tiny they are. This is on some wide whale corduroy that we use for flags. Um, they're easily scratched off. But the irritating saliva from their bites can cause your itch to persist for three weeks or longer. You can take baths with either baking soda or colloidal oatmeal or even go out in the, in the ocean. That will help to reduce the itch. 
But like we said, the pictures are mislabeled on the internet and oftentimes larval lone star ticks are tagged as jiggers. Now, when you go out to hike, carry extra shoes and socks with you. Bag up your socks and shoes that are covered with larval lone star ticks from your hike before you get in your car because otherwise you're gonna be hanging out for several weeks, you know, grooving out to your music, sitting in the back seat, fighting, resetting the GPS. You don't want that. But I mean, they'll eventually they'll cook and then they won't be a problem anymore, but they can be problematic, especially if we have a cool spring like we've had. Once you get home, throw all of your larval Lone Star tick covered gear into the dryer, if you can, for high heat on one hour. They will survive the washing machine, and we'll talk more about what they can survive later, but that's the best way to do it. If you cannot put something in the dryer, solarize them, put it in a plastic bag and stick it out in the sun until they cook, okay. So there may be more that Lone Star larvae do. Alpha-gal syndrome. So basically, um, it takes a couple of encounters with massive amounts of tick saliva from Lone Star ticks to develop this. And you may, not, you may never develop it, or you may develop it very quickly, and you can develop different degrees of severity. You go and you have your hamburger at your barbecue, and then you go to bed, and five or six hours later, there's always a delay, you wake up and you're like, uh-oh, something is not right. So you stagger into the bathroom, you turn the mirror on, and you've got blotches all over you. You might be wheezing a little bit. You're having an allergic reaction. Every time you eat some sort of mammalian meat, the same thing happens. There is a sugar carbohydrate, uh, I'm sorry, carbohydrate protein moiety called uh, alpha galactose. And basically, this works very similarly to strep throat. They tell you to eat all of your antibiotics associated with a strep throat infection, because if you let that infection go long enough so your body naturally produces antibodies to it, those antibodies can't tell the difference between the strep organism and the proteins of your heart. In alpha-gal, what happens is that your body produces antibodies to the proteins and carbohydrate moiety and tick saliva, and then it can't tell the difference between a tick saliva attack and the consumption of mammalian meat because there's an a galac alpha galactose uh, similar uh, moiety on the mammalian meat. And this is what we know as alpha gal syndrome. So basically what you need to do is you need to stop eating mammalian meat. You may even have a reaction to gelatin in foods or you may have a reaction to dairy in really severe cases. And this can go on for years, or you may get over it after a while. You can eat as much chicken and fish and poultry, turkey, uh, as you want. But you cannot eat venison. You can't eat goat. You can't eat sheep. You can't eat pork. You can't eat um, beef. And, you know, that's, that's basically because your body cannot tell the difference. Uh, venison, I think I mentioned. Um, when you... Uh, go to the doctor. You don't want a regular meat allergy test. There's actually an IgE test for alpha-gal that will confirm a clinical diagnosis of the alpha-gal. Otherwise, you may end up with a false result if you just go with a plain old meat allergy test. Okay, now safe tick removal. Some of my colleagues even will panic when a tick bites them and they'll start digging at the tick with unsterilized fingernails or unsterilized um, tweezers, and you can end up with a horrible infection that way. So there is a way to remove the tick um, that will usually work without breaking the tick up. So what you wanna do is you wanna slide uh, your tweezers as close to the head of the tick as you possibly can, clamp down, you're perpendicular to the tick. Then you rotate around about 45 degrees, still grabbing the tick, and then you pull slowly and steadily backwards at a 45 degree angle until the tick comes out. Invariably, the tick head may break off in certain circumstances. So then you run around the house as fast as you can, screaming at the top of your lungs, I got a tick out of me, I got a tick out of me, I got a tick out of me. Once you finish your tick head hissy, then you need to make a decision. Most of the time, uh, that's gonna be the end of it. You want to treat the area where you were bitten with something drying like alcohol or peroxide and treat it you know, multiple times and that will be that. One, if the tick head is in there, it's not gonna do anything else. It will eventually dry out and drop off in a few days. If you feel like you cannot stop yourself from digging at that, 
then you need to go to the doctor or walk-in clinic and have them deal with the head. But in any case, you always want to watch it because if you have what you feel is uh, not is unusual swelling or redness or anything at all, then you want to go to the doctor and have them remove that. And obviously, for demonstration purposes, this is a picture. This is a faked picture because a tick has already obviously had a really big meal, but it shows you where you need to grab the head of the tick. And there we go. He was perfect for Star Wars, but he didn't get cast, or she was. All right. Now, what about coating the tick? Never coat the tick with nail polish, even if it's pretty nail polish, or petroleum jelly, or any other substance. Don't harass the tick like you see on the internet with a Q-tip where they go, blah, 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 and the tick's going round and round and round. I mean, you think about it. What happens if you take a little kid to Disney World, if it's open, um, and you put them on the teacup ride. What's the first thing they do when they get off? They puke. You do not want a tick to puke directly into the conduit it has into your bloodstream, because that's what will happen if you use petroleum jelly or your nail polish or you're harassing it in any way. So that would not be good, because then any diseases it's carrying get dumped directly into your bloodstream. Now, a lot of people love to set fire to the tick as a form of revenge, but when you think about it, you set fire to the tick, the tick is going to explode. And then you're gonna have tick guts on your lip, in your eye, on your glasses, in your coffee cup. And that's not good either because whatever diseases they may be carrying, they're gonna end up on that as well. So again, the best thing to do is to put the tick into a Ziploc bag, if it's bitten you, write the date on it, and write the date in your calendar and put it in the freezer. Throw out the Ben and Jerry's, it's been in there since 1983, et cetera. Keep it for three weeks and that way if you develop any symptoms, you have a record of the date and you also have the tick that did it so that you know what kind of tick it is or you can have the tick identified and that will tell you what sort of diseases you may or may not be dealing with. Okay, that's just a picture there. There I am again. Okay, tick keys, yeah, they're fine. You can slide those under and, and twist it. The only thing with those is sometimes if the tick is really tiny, it's hard to pick up the flap of the tick and get it to twist out. Never squeeze the body of the tick. I see a lot of people doing this too because they want revenge and so they take their fingernails. Again, whatever's in the tick, we all have little cuts and things on our hands, especially since we work outdoors. It'll go right into your bloodstream. And again, write the date on the bag that the tick is in and mark it down on your calendar. Okay, so don't burn or crush the tick. Um, ticks on clothing or small gear, as we said, should be put in the dryer to dry them out and kill them. And that's especially important for larval lone star ticks. And again, if you do not wish to hold on to the tick, if it didn't bite you, there's a couple of things you can do. Number one, you can take two loops of tape, one across the tick this way, and then one this way, because they can actually wiggle their way out of a single loop of tape. They're like, hip, 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 and they wiggle and they wiggle and suddenly a couple hours later you come back and you've got an empty loop of tape and you're like, oh crap, where did it go? But the double loop usually keeps it confined and you can throw it away. Another thing I see people do all the time, this is a really bad idea, is they decide they're going to flush the tip. Now remember I said they can survive water. If you put them in a washing machine, they can crawl up on the rim and it's like splish splash for them. They watch the, watch the machine go around and around and around. Same thing with the toilet. You think you flushed it, but then three o'clock in the morning, you go staggering to the bathroom going, I gotta pee, I gotta pee. And that tick is waiting for you on the rim of the toilet going, come to me, it's funny. So don't do that either. Put it on tape, see, I told you. Okay, now precautions, repellents, and what happens with your gear and your clothing. Okay, meet your two new best friends, masking tape on the left and fancy masking tape on the right. This should always be in your day pack. It should go with you everywhere because if you do run into larval ticks, you can't pick all them off, but you can certainly wrap a piece of this tape backwards or use lint roller and they will all be stuck to the tape when they can't get off of that. And so it's a good way to get them off quickly. And also you can take a sample home and see what you have. Wear boots, solid boots without holes like gum boots, and or tick gaiters, which fit over your boots. You can buy the tick gaiters um, and they're a finely woven material. Um, wear your socks over your pants, but remember the socks have to be really tightly woven. Wrap a band of masking tape inside out because that they'll stick to that as they walk up. 
Stay to the center of the paths, but remember that lone stars will come out and follow your chemical trail. And other ticks tend to quest on grass. They will crawl up to about deer belly height, which is 18 inches, and they'll sort of wave around, whoa, 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 whoa. And then they'll hop onto you as you walk by. But remember too that for when you're thinking about where ticks are during the day, the ticks that do this sort of questing tend to have to take a coffee break after a certain amount of time because they have to rehydrate. So they'll climb back down into the leaf litter, you know, they'll have a cup of coffee, read the newspaper, and then they come back up and then they quest again. So it's not 100% of the time questing. The, the place where they can quest 100% of the time is underneath a Japanese barberry. You should get rid of your Japanese barberry plants because they're invasive anyway, but the shape of the plant is such that it can maintain an atmosphere of humidity where the ticks actually don't need to go down and take a coffee break. Plus deer love to hang out in barberry. They don't eat it, but they like to hang out near it. So that's another perfect storm for your tick and what they like to hang out with. So again, tightly woven athletic fabric, fabrics or even pantyhose. In the Far East, there's a mite that causes something called, called tsuchikamushi disease, which is a lot of fun to say. Um, but that finely woven pantyhose material, even the military wear it, even <laughs> men and women, to help to reduce the number of ticks that are going to bother you. Check yourself, your gear, and your pets frequently for ticks during your hike. And don't fall into the trap of thinking just because you've sprayed yourself that you are safe. Carry a magnifying glass and masking tape and tweezers um, to remove them from you or your gear or your pets. Okay, this is my colleague Marie Caminaris. Um, this is her Westie and she's checking out her Westie for ticks. Um, and the one thing you have to do when you get home is you have to check yourself out, especially your nooks and crannies. This is a lighted mechanics mirror on the right. Um, it telescopes so that you can check uh, in the back because if you don't check your nooks and crannies, then you're going to end up with ticks in your buns. Okay, so a little bit about questing ticks. Remember I said that ticks will hang on to a piece of grass and they kind of wave around. This picture of a tick's leg and the diagram shows that little hook on the end that allows them very effectively to climb up. And why are they climbing up? You think about it, if you're a grazing mammal, where's the one place you can't scratch? The back of your neck and your head. So that's why you always end up with a lot of ticks on their ears and things like that. Repellents, not what you might think. Again, I see professionals or quasi-professionals, I guess, recommending putting lavender dryer sheets in your pocket and you'll be just fine. No, you won't. You'll smell good, but you're not going to be protected from ticks, unfortunately. What factors affect how well your repellents work? Well, um, it may be the frequency and uniformity of your application and how much of an effective concentration is maintained near your skin surface, the number and species attempting to bite, the inherent attractive qualities of the host, carbon dioxide, activity level of the host, but also rubbing from clothing, evaporation or absorption from skin surface, washing off from sweat or rain, I could sweat in an igloo, I swear it, wind, and here's the one that really gets Higher temperatures, each increase of 18 degrees, which is really not hard to imagine if you start the day at 50 and it gets up to 68, can lead to as much as a 50% reduction in protection time. So this is not a good thing. So you have to really be careful with your repellents and make sure that you're practicing good repellent use. Um, obviously, you never want to apply repellents on cuts or wounds or irritated skin or your eyes or your mouth or your face, apply it to your hands. Do this, don't breathe it, don't spray it in an enclosed space or near food. Um, you don't need a lot, you just need a thin film to be protective. Um, also, very, very important, do not go by brand names. This is a brand name. That means nothing. It's what's in the fine print down here that will tell you what the active ingredient is, and that's very important. And this is where we come to the horrible realization that DEET, which is the gold standard for mosquitoes, does not work very well against ticks. So you need to go and check all the bottles of stuff you have to see if it's DEET or if it's something different. Preferably, you will have a repellent that has Picaridin or IR3535 in it. There's a picture. You can check what's in your repellent, either by on the orange one, 
the EPA registration number, which is very important, or by the active ingredient. You may need a stack of glasses from the dollar store like I have to see what's going on because it's not just the active ingredient that makes a difference, it's also the percentage of active ingredient and in the formulation. So there's a great way to check this and you can go to an EPA website to rate your repellent. If you double Google, you put in EPA in quotes, and then you put rate my repellent or just repellent in quotes, this site should pop up. You can export the entire site very easily. It's only like 36 pages. It has the EPA rate registration number. It has the active ingredient. It has the trade name, which would be like, you know, Cutter or Deep Woods or whatever. But most importantly, it has the research listed in the number of hours that that product will protect you if it's used correctly for both ticks and mosquitoes if the research has been done. Fabulous, fabulous resource. Very, very important. Picaridin, very effective against ticks. It's derived from pepper, but all picaridin formulations are not created equal. You have to run your product. It's EPA registration number. You can search that database, find out how long it lasts. So that's very important. And then there's IR3535, which may have a slight edge on deer tick nymph repellency. This one is harder to find than the Picardin, but you can mail order it. We're all mail ordering everything now. And then um, DEET, not so great for ticks, good for mosquitoes. Um, and also just a DEET uh, mention in total, even if you're using it for mosquitoes, once you get a DEET formulation that's above about 50%, that doesn't offer any better protection than just 50%. So why expose yourself to excess repellent if you do not need it? Okay, um, oil of lemon eucalyptus. This is a new kit on the block. This also has some protection time somewhere between two and six hours, but not as long a time as some of the formulations of Picard in an IR3535. Now, let's talk about the big bad permethrin. Permethrin is not a repellent, never on your skin. This is an insecticide. So this is for your gear. You can do this two ways. You can spray this onto your gear and allow it to dry. But when you use this, not inside. You wanna be outside, good ventilation. Also some kitty cats are a little bit sensitive to this and cats are curious. So if you're gonna spray your stuff, do it while the cats are otherwise occupied. Uh, but you can also buy pre-treated gear and clothing, and the clothing usually will have the number of washes before it's considered to be not effective anymore. You can treat your shoes, etc. But permethrin is a pesticide, not a repellent. So very important to remember that because, again, I have seen people that should know better using this like a repellent, and it scares me to death when I see that. Oh, another good tip, and this comes from Moses Sisora of Suffolk County Vector Control, is he buys terry cloth wristbands, and he uses these on his wrists and on his ankles. He'll spray it with permethrin, allow it to dry, and then don them, and that keeps the ticks from crawling across the barrier to a certain extent. So that is, I think, a really great tip. Okay, so now I think we have, all right, come on. Okay, citronella, not so swell repellent for anything, uh, hour or less for mosquitoes and not really great for ticks. Ah, here's my other colleague, Marie. I have two Marie's as colleagues and they're a great help uh, to me. She is all dolled up to go on a tick safari. You can see she has a light colored hat, light colored clothing, long sleeves, solid boots, and she has her masking tape right there, but she also has a tick checking flag and she's made this herself. This is simply a long furring strip or even a dowel can be used and a piece of white flannel. You can get something that's a little bit heavier duty. You can use light colored corduroy that will be more long lasting. But basically this is the way to see if you have ticks in your environment. I mean, if you're out there scouting, you expect to have ticks in your environment, but if you wanna check your yard, you can easily do this. You wanna select an area to sample where you should be able to say yes to at least one of the following questions. Is the area considered a high risk area frequented by people or pets? Is the area near where deer may be bedding or traveling or grazing? Are small mammals such as mice, groundhogs, or raccoons seen in the area? If you can say yes to any one of those questions or more than one of those questions, that's where you should be sampling. 
So again, you can simply take apart a white flannel pillowcase and staple it onto an old broom handle if you want. There are fancier ways to do it and there are simpler ways to do it. When you wash that flag, I mean, put it in the dryer first to get any ticks off of there and get them killed. But when you wash the flag, no detergent because you don't want any scent on there that will repel the ticks because that'll give you a false idea of what may be there. Also, make sure you don't get a lot of repellent on it or permethrin as well. The thing with checking for ticks is that it only gives you a snapshot. It doesn't give you an idea of the volume of ticks you may have. It tells you simply, yes, they're there, yes or no. So it's not a be all and end all sort of thing. What you wanna do is choose a sunny day with fairly dry conditions. Ticks are usually not active in cool temperatures. So wait till about 10 a.m. or later. And the holding a rope, if you put a rope on your flag, which you can do, or your stick, you're gonna drag it across the ground or drag it through the bushes for about 10 steady paces. Then flip the cloth and count the number and types and life stages of the ticks. This is a single sample. Then you can get them off the flag and yourself with masking tape. And when you're finished, again, you can throw it in the dryer and wash as we recommend it. If the number of ticks in a single sample exceeds between five to 10 adults or nymphs, you have a hot spot for ticks and should take appropriate protective measures when entering the area. So as we said, ticks have an absolute requirement for moisture. Don't over irrigate the area. And remember that about 70%, just checking the time, of ticks are found, nymph stage ticks are found within three yards of the edge of a turfed area. They love to hide in the leaf litter. If you put out a wood chip barrier that's about three feet wide over plastic sheeting, that can keep your black legged ticks down. But the lone star ticks will crawl right across there and into the yard because they don't mind those hotter, drier conditions. Dog ticks are a little bit more on the fence. They don't need quite as much moisture as your deer ticks but they still need some moisture. So again, they're gonna be found in that interface between the woods and the yard, and ticks do love ground covers. So think about modifications that can reduce animal trafficking, especially mowing more frequently, mowing ground covers occasionally. Okay, the slippery slope of landscape treatment for plants, or ticks, I mean. Where are the ticks? Well, we said that here is sort of where they are. You can read that for yourself, but your control efforts really should concentrate on the area between the edge of the woods and the edge of the lawn if you're gonna control things. But a lot of times people are simply throwing their money away. Because if you have deer ticks, they're gonna be always down deep in the leaf litter. So if you don't have a backpack blower, blower or not backpack, um, not blower, um, applicator that's going to stir up the leaf litter, you're not going to get to them. And if you've got Lone Star ticks, remember that they wander, so you need a residual. Deer ticks, no, they don't go very far. So there's a lot more that goes into this than just simple treatments. And here we see everybody's dream home upstate, I guess. But we have two zones here, clearly. We've got plants around the perimeter of the house, and we have plants around the perimeter of the yard. One of the best strategies that you can do, if you wanna use organic materials, which generally do not work as well as the traditional materials, you'd put those around the house where they're more likely to be encountered by pets or by children. And you're gonna have fewer ticks because you've got that space of lawn and go with more traditional treatments around that outer perimeter of the yard, if you're gonna treat it all. And many times those out perimeter treatments are, are useless because of the ticks behavior. Okay. So now, let's see, let's go through this very quickly. And we're gonna go, there's that Japanese barberry I told you to get rid of. Let's talk about disease because I believe our time is growing nigh. Okay, I'll talk about garlic. What about garlic or other organics? Garlic can minimize questing, you know, whoa, 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 for two to three days, but then it sort of goes away. Other organics have low efficacy compared to the more traditional pyrethrins or synthetic pyrethroids. Remember too, as I said, ticks may hide in the leaf litter or lay low for a few days and then come back or trafficking animals may bring them back. Um, so read up on your products too, because many times the research that's done looks very attractive, looks very efficient, but if it's done in the lab and not done in the field, you're probably not getting a fair idea of how well the product works and you're also getting different behaviors of ticks in the laboratory compared to the way they behave 
in the great outdoors. So be very careful with any um, uh, research because people can manipulate research or you have to make sure you've got a good trial where you have controls versus treatments. And that's one of the things that you can look for. Deer fencing is excellent. Um, not everybody can afford it, but greater than five years of deer fencing around greater than 7.4 acres yields at least a greater than 45 production reduction of nymphs compared to outside the fence and a greater than 75% reduction of ticks within fenced residential areas. Okay, so the best strategy, a combination of techniques. Okay, now the parable of tick-borne disease. What does the dog tick carry? Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That's really the main one. And remember that Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is a bacterial disease and it's a rickettsial disease. So that makes it a little bit specialized in terms of the kind of bacteria it is. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is not included, the last I knew, on a typical tick panel. So be very careful with that because, oh, I had a tick panel, I'm fine, everything was negative. Well, did they test for everything? Maybe not. Find out exactly which diseases you're tested for. Occasionally, the dog tick can carry a nasty bacterial disease called tularemia um, or rabbit fever. And usually there will be something called an eschar or an ulcer at the point of the tick bite. And you can have some really nasty symptoms with that. Rocky Mountain spotted fever, to go back to that, can cause this. If you ever develop this, go to the hospital immediately. These are petechial hemorrhages. The other disease name for Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever is black measles. This means that your uh, immune system, like with COVID-19, has gone haywire and you've got little clots everywhere, which obviously can develop into something exceedingly nasty. So go to the hospital. All right, deer or black-legged ticks, which diseases do they carry? Hands down, this is the one that's doing a lot of heavy lifting with multiple diseases, and usually it's the nymph. Lyme disease, Powassan virus or deer tick virus, which are very closely related. This can be transmitted in 15 minutes, but it's not very common. It's very nasty, but it's not very common, fortunately. Anaplasmosis, another rickettsial disease, which is becoming more common, and babesiosis. Babesiosis is not a bacteria. It is a protozoa. So if you are not responding to antibiotic treatment and you haven't been tested for babesiosis, it's probably time that you do so. And there are some really good fact sheets from the CDC which describe the diseases. Many of the symptoms for all these diseases are similar. Fever, malaise, body aches, etc. And you need some sort of blood work to try to distinguish one from the other. But if you want to read about the diseases to get the details, try the CDC for their fact sheets. Um, and another one that's showing up on Long Island that is transmitted by the deer, the black-legged tick, is Borrelia myomotoi. My friend got laid low by this one and they kept saying she was negative for tick-borne disease and she got so sick and finally they checked and sure enough, that's what she had. There's another disease that's carried by the black-legged tick or the deer tick, which I haven't mentioned yet, I'll get to in a minute, called Bartonella, which has a very bizarre rash with it. With Lyme disease, you don't use the rash to say, oh yes, I have it or no, I don't have it because a lot of times you'll have Lyme disease without the rash or the rash is, excuse me, atypical, or the rash is associated with another tick-borne illness. But with Bartonella, which we don't see on this list, the rash is pretty much unmistakable. And I'll show you a minute. There are those mouth parts again. The BZ is a protozoa, doesn't respond to antibiotics. Viruses do not respond to antibiotics. Powassan virus, we know, can be transmitted in 15, degree, 15 minutes, but it's not very common. Um, okay, the reservoir for babesiosis is white-footed mice and meadow voles. We have an awful lot of voles around these last couple of years. And 25% of Lyme disease people, patients, are also infected either with um, Bartonella or with anaplasmosis or babesiosis. Okay. Now, Lone Star ticks. Which diseases do they carry? Well, they carry another rickettsial disease. Ticks and rickettsia are like peanut butter and jelly. They go together. Ehrlichiosis, and this can make you extremely ill. And you can have two different tick-borne diseases at the same time. Yeah, 
way. You can have two different diseases from two different kinds of ticks at the same time, double yay. Occasionally, Lone Star ticks can carry tularemia, that's the one with the ulcer, and we know that this is the only tick so far that can give you alpha-gal syndrome, but that other tick, that new one, that um, Asian longhorn tick, in its own country or in its home territory, that can also cause an alpha-gal-like illness near the mouth parts. Okay. Uh, all right. So there is a summary slide. Woohoo! Um, deer tick nymphs, stay away from them. And unfortunately, they do not itch like Lone Star ticks do. Okay. There's the nymph now. All right. So Borrelia is maintained in mice, or is maintained in deer. And just because the tick is carrying a disease doesn't mean it's going to transmit it to you. Even if it transmits it to you, doesn't mean you'll acquire the disease because your immune system may say, oh, oh, and get it. So it's, it's unfortunately, it is a crapshoot. Okay. Are chipmunks the secret enemy? Disney loves chipmunks, but chipmunks may be the secret enemy because they are verminous. I remember the first time one of my cats caught a chipmunk, almost done, chipmunk, and I thought, oh, well, poor chipmunk, and then I turned it over and went, woo, because it's got all of these things running around on it. It had fleas, it had ticks, it had all sorts of things because the chipmunk is not a good groomer, unlike some other creatures. It does not groom itself well. Possums are good groomers, but chipmunks are not. So be careful wherever you see chipmunks or white-footed mice, you know that you may have ticks in that area. Also ticks, or I'm sorry, also chipmunks, they don't move very far. They have a burrow and then they keep that little radius around there. So that's a possibility too. Turkeys are associated with Lone Star ticks and they travel fairly long distances because of their territories. So there are those rashes. We really cannot go by them except um, with Bartonella, which I'll show you in a minute. And right here is an explanation for why people test negative for Lyme disease when they really have it. Do you see that red line running around that spiral bacteria? That's the outer surface protein. And your immunological tests are only as good as the outer surface protein that they are based on. Unfortunately, Borrelia tends to change its outer surface protein. And so, and it does it frequently. And so if you happen to be unlucky enough to be infected by a Borrelia that has a different outer surface protein, you'll show up as negative when really you're positive. Now they're working on testing to, to pick that up. And so there are a whole bunch of different places that talk about testing, but the gist is right now there's a two-step process using the same blood sample. Usually they'll begin with an enzyme immunoassay. If that's negative, you're good to go as long as you don't still have symptoms. But if you do, they might take a second blood test to look for a rising antibody level to Lyme disease. That's called a paired antibody test. Or they may take your same blood test, the first one you had, and if your enzyme immunoassay is a little weird and you're still having symptoms but it's showing negative, they might go ahead and do something called a Western block. That will detect protein specific to Lyme disease, and that also will get rid of that problem of that protein-based uh, uh, immunology. So there's the Western blot, there's the EIA. I've actually done both of those tests back when I was working on my master's degree. So diseases, like I said, all have the same symptoms, but let me show you, there's that Bartonella rash. It looks like stretch marks. But that's really strange. The other strange thing with Bartonella is that you'll have pain in the bottom of your feet. And that's very strange too. So keep that in mind in case you're having some oddball symptoms. And here is a typical tick panel. What does a typical tick panel test for? Ehrlichia, anaplasma, Babesia, and Lyme disease. Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, Bartonella, Borrelia mimotoi. So if you feel you have a tick-borne disease, but you've come up negative and you really think it is something tick-borne, keep pushing. You are your own best health advocate. These are the things that it doesn't account for. Um, as I said, tularemia, which is rare, Powassan is rare. And of course, alpha-gal is not a disease at all. It's an allergy. Okay, 
So there's a really cool typical tick algorithm, testing algorithm that you can pick up from this website. Do check out um, CDC fact sheets on tick-borne diseases. And when deer numbers are down to six to 12 per square mile, tick-borne disease is rare in humans, but in some areas of Long Island, I think we're up to maybe 200 per square mile, just in a couple of areas, but we have way too many deer. We truly do. And I think because it is 1202, that I am going to stop there. Here's Possum, and I will open this up to questions. I will drag you all back onto my screen here. Um, and that is it, I believe. Great, thank you. Samson, you definitely do not disappoint as a presenter and the information you provide is great. I try not to. <laughs> I'm sorry. Listening to me must be something like a cross between a migraine. <laughs> Does somebody have a question? Um, I, I, I do. My name is Donna. I actually know a, a little Hello? Donna? Yeah, hi. I, I didn't want to, I don't know if somebody else was talking. Sometimes it's hard to hear me. Yeah, there's definitely feedback. Hold on one second. Okay, Donna, ask your question. Oh, okay. Um, actually, I've had uh, some professional experience with Lyme disease because years ago I worked uh, at Stony Brook on a neurologic Lyme disease project. So I like to stay current and this was, this was an excellent presentation. Is there a way to share the slides with participants? Yes. I can. Okay, because that would be really helpful. Plus, personally, my brother actually caught uh, a dual infection out of season and was deathly ill for about five months yeah. where he was he, he caught a uh, line plus rocky mountain spotted at the same oh, time geez. in Poor december uh, oh. we lived we live down by the nisquag river in san remo yeah, by the green good, belt good. and we have a patch of woods next to us and the deer go across his lawn so people yeah. really have to pay attention to keeping the lawn you know short and my brother would go out in the dead of winter wearing shorts barefooted so oh. Uh, so people, uh, people have to be mindful too to look for symptoms out of season. So that was the point I really wanted to emphasize to everybody. You are absolutely correct. It only people go out to their mailbox, and we don't realize that we tend to enrich the soil around our mailbox because we tend to plant flowers around there, and it's warm. And so, of course, the ticks are hanging out in there. They like it. It's moist. Yeah. Does anyone else have a question? They're hoping for a bathroom break soon. Yeah. Trying to unmute everyone. Let's see. Say they're unmuted. Hold on, everybody. I muted everybody and now it's not unmuting everyone. Um, you want me to try? People can unmute themselves. If they just go yeah. and they click on the little microphone, they should be yeah. able to. Holly, you want me to try from this end? Yeah, I think if you need to speak, if you would like to ask a question, just unmute yourself. I guess I would just like to know if um, this recording is going to be posted on a website um, so that way we can go back and see the slides that were went over pretty fast. Yes, yeah. we will post this to our website at the Central Pine Barrens Commission. Um, and we can also post the presentation um, as well in a PDF form. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And thank you, Tamsin. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? No other questions. They can always email me too. Okay. Too. Great. 
Well, thank you very much, Tamson. Uh, very much appreciate your time. And that always happens to me too. <laughs> it does. So, um, but no, I just wanted to express my appreciation, my thanks for your time. And um, we hope to continue to do additional trainings like this through the Protected Lands Council. Um, and um, if anybody does have any questions, um, we can connect you to Tamson. Um, and we thank you for your time. So no enjoy problem. the day and be right. safe out there. Um, yeah, everybody else questions too. On anything, uh, we're all readily available.